to sorry okay hello and welcome to fab friday fab friday is part of the osher lifelong learning institute where we present lunch and learn presentations throughout the year the fab friday general topics committee members are barbara Gwizrock, bruce jones martha marshall sue kibler and me my name's Jane Yokoyama, and I'm happy to host this Fab Friday's presentation, The Crucial Role of Pollinators. Our guest speaker is Brian Tompkins from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Brian grew up in a small Georgia rural farming community where he developed his interest and appreciation of nature. In 1995, he graduated from Georgia College and State University with a Bachelor of Science degree. He began his career working for the National Park Service with the Blue Ridge Parkway, but for the past 15 years, he has worked as a biologist for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. He currently is Southeast Region Recovery Biologist for the Federally Endangered Rusty Patched Bumblebee, one of my favorite bumblebees. Brian's also the Energy Project Coordinator for the Asheville Office. Here he works with energy companies to protect endangered species from the impacts of energy production projects. He is a founding member of North Carolina Pollinator Conservation Alliance and an active member of the Asheville B City Leadership Committee. In this webinar format, your videos and audio will be on mute. Please write any questions you may have in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. Brian will try and answer as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. A recording of this webinar will be available later in the spring. Then you can che check the OLLI website under presentations. Finally, at the end of the webinar, I will give you details on future Fab Friday talks and how you can be involved. Okay, without further ado, it's my pleasure to welcome Brian Tompkins. Thank you very much. Hey. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. And uh, thanks, Jane, for that fabulous introduction. Um, I want to first thanks, uh, uh, throw some thanks out to Ollie for having me here today on this Fab Friday. Um, I do wish we could be in person. I enjoy the interactions and the feedback from being in front of everybody and just kind of discussing and going through this thing. But uh, I want to thank you for joining me on the webinar today. Um, I look forward to uh, going through the presentation and then you know hopefully being able to address some questions and maybe if nothing else uh spur some further interest in pollinators and maybe get to work with some of you in the future uh, so with that I, I am my name is brian tunkins i work in the Asheville field office which is over by unca um and pollinators you know just to give you a little intro on myself uh, uh pollinators weren't or uh, were not my primary studies in school but over the years and Kind of working with the Fish and Wildlife Service, it has definitely become a, a incredible interest of mine, and uh, the value of that, hopefully, and some of my passions uh, will probably come through on on the presentation today. Um, and with that, uh, let's get started. I'm I'm hopefully going to wrap this up uh, within an hour's time, which would give us um, 20 minutes or so for some questions. Um, so let's get started. Uh, because of the different ecoregions in North Carolina, uh, North Carolina has a very diverse pollinator species. You know, it, it, geologically, uh, North Carolina uh, has a lot of different areas. You have the coastal areas, the Piedmont, and the mountains. And because of those different areas, we have lots of room for different species to, to, to exist here. Um, and you've probably heard of some of the common names of many types of bees in North Carolina, uh, bumblebees, carpenter bees, sweat bees. Um, some of you may have even heard of other bees. Uh, you know, there's resin bees and mining, mining bees and mason bees. Um, but actually, uh, there are over 500 species of native bees in North Carolina. And uh, of those, there are about 17 species of bumblebees. 11 of those bumblebees occur only here in the mountain region of North Carolina. Uh, two species occur only in the lower Piedmont and coastal regions. And then there's four that occur statewide. Uh, 
there's about in North Carolina, there's there's over 2,300 species of moths and over 175 species of butterflies across the U.S. Uh, just to give you some some facts on that, the diversity of pollinators is even more astounding. Uh, there's 4,000 species of bees in the U.S., about 800 species of butterflies, and over 12,000 species of moths. Uh, though my presentation uh, focuses a lot on butterflies, moths, and bees, it's important to remember that these are not the only species uh, that provide pollination services to, to plants. Uh, flies, ants, bats, hummingbirds, beetles, and wasps are all important pollinators too. These days it seems like we constantly hear uh, about pollinators in the news, um, at garden centers, uh, even on cereal boxes. Uh, and some of you may be asking yourself, why are pollinators suddenly getting all this attention? Uh, even more curiously, you may, you may be asking yourself, why in the world is this Fish and Wildlife Service guy here talking to us today about pollinators? He's a wildlife biologist, right? But uh, actually, there's several reasons that the, that the Fish and Wildlife Service has started working on uh, pollinator conservation and uh, protection and assessing species. First and foremost, the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, recognizes the essential roles and importance of pollinators, not only in maintaining healthy habitats, but also in supporting humans and, and life as we know it. Uh, so what makes those pollinators so important? Well, there's about 87% of the world's flowering plant species are animal pollinated. Bees in particular, are necessary for the fertilization of up to 90% of the world's 107 most important human consumed crops. Those include things like corn, plantain, wheat, uh, uh, and uh, yams, potatoes. Uh, also, pollinators provide for increased uh, crop production that increase in crop production accounts for about $30 billion worth of agricultural production. And from most of the statistics you'll look at, uh, that $30 billion is broken down. Uh, about $15 billion of that is conducted by uh, honeybees. And the other $15 billion worth of pollination is done by our native pollinator species. Some, another reason is some plants can only be pollinated by native bees. Uh, some of you may have heard of uh, buzz pollination. Buzz pollination, our bumblebees, uh, are one of the few species that actually do buzz pollination. And what that is, uh, certain plants, plants and, and pollinators have evolved together for over millions of years. And so some plants have developed uh, uh, a need for a special type of pollinator to conduct the pollination services for that species. Bumblebees can do buzz pollination and even some of our crops like tomatoes uh, require buzz pollination. But bumblebees do buzz pollination and what it means is when they land on a plant they can actually contract their muscles, their thoracic muscles up to about 400 times a second. And that intense vibration creates a frequency that the plant recognizes and it will only release its pollen once that frequency is met. And so if any other bee was to land on that, it wouldn't necessarily have pollen to be able to pick up. So species like bumblebees can land in and, and buzz pollinate uh, those plants. Um, and we'll talk in a little bit more, we'll go into a little bit more of buzz pollination and some of the uh, uh, specialization of some pollinators in a little bit. Uh, another thing is uh, pollinators account for increased consistency of cross-pollination in plants. This results in greater genetic variation of plant species. Um, this is really important in helping uh, plants to uh, change over time, genetic, uh, genetic changes that allow them to evolve and, and to uh, maintain existence with changing uh, weather pattern, changing climate, changing weather, changing uh, situations and where they exist. And also pollinators are vital to creating and maintaining habitats and ecosystems that many animals rely on for abundant, uh, abundant food and clean water. 
So why else is the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, involved in pollinators? Well, uh, the second reason is uh, there was an issuance of a presidential memorandum in 2014. The then Obama administration uh, uh, issued this presidential memorandum. And though some of the federal agencies had been working on pollinators for, for years, uh, the memorandum pointed to the significant loss of pollinators uh, from the environment and recognized the vital role that pollinators play in maintaining healthy ecosystems and adequate uh, crop production. Uh, the memorandum directed executive agencies and departments to develop and implement strategies uh, to into their projects that protect and conserve pollinators. Uh, this provided the Fish and Wildlife Service with the opportunity and the justification to prioritize actions and direct our funding toward projects that are beneficial uh, to pollinators. And then uh, lastly, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service the, is, uh, in, it, we administered the Endangered Species Act. And so due to the decline uh, and the declines of pollinator species that we've been seeing, uh, we are concerned that declines will uh, result in diversity uh, reduction of plant species, which would adversely affect animals and birds that rely on them. Uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, since we administer the Endangered Species Act, it's our job to assess species and to determine whether or not they, their, their populations have decreased to a level to where they need to be put on the threatened or endangered list. Um, today, uh, pollinator species uh, that are on the threatened and endangered list, we have three bats, uh, five birds, 29 le lepidopterans, that's butterflies and moths, uh, and uh, one beetle, one fly, and one bumblebee, and that's the rusty patch bumblebee, as Jane spoke to earlier. Um, and just to put that out there, since the 1950s, five butterfly, ex butterfly species have gone extinct. Um, so we are, we are seeing these massive losses of pollinator populations. Exactly how many listed plant species uh, are, are require pollinators uh, is currently unknown. Several species that are currently being reviewed um, on the screen, let's see, let me get my pointer here. Uh, Regal fritillary is currently going, is being assessed uh, for, poten for potential listing um, due to loss of habitat. Uh, it used to occur here in North Carolina. We have occurrence data, but hasn't been found in uh, it's been about 15 years or so, 20 or 20 years. Um, frosted elfin is another butterfly species, as is American bumblebee. Um, uh, American bumblebee is, was once a very common bumblebee, much like uh, the rusty patch bumblebee. Rusty patch bumblebee occurred across the eastern half of the United States. Um, it was one of the most abundant species, bumblebee species that you would find on the landscape. And uh, since the 90s, though, it has virtually disappeared. Um, we haven't seen it in North Carolina since 2004. And since the late 90s, uh, its population has decreased uh, around 94%. And, and its range has also decreased around, along those same lines. We also are currently assessing um, monarch butterfly. And, uh, that species is probably one of the most recognizable butterfly species that I know of. Um, it, it occurs across the United States and there are three subpopulations that occur. There's the West Coast population, the Central population and the East Coast population, subpopulation. And everybody kind of sees them, they fly around, they're everywhere. And many of you are probably asking yourselves, you know, are they really uh, that, are they really declining? I still see them. And the answer is yes. Uh, unfortunately, we've seen huge declines in this species. And uh, the total area, just to give you an idea of how this species has declined, 
the total area that they once occupied in Mexico when they go down and overwinter down there was once over almost six hectares. Uh, and that was up until around 2004, 2004, we started seeing declines. And from 2004 to 2017, the average size of that uh, overwintering population down there declined to about three, uh, three to three and a half hectares. So a decrease in, in just spatial range or spatial uh, availability, how, many, how much land it takes up there has gone in half. Another way to think of it is there, up until really 1997, the late 90s, um, there was counts that took up over a, a, around a billion monarchs in, in Mexico that would overwinter down there. One billion monarchs. Um, in the last 20 years, uh, by, not, by 2017, that number had decreased to 93 million from 1 billion to 93 million. That's over a, a 90% uh, reduction in, in population numbers. So it is really taking a hit uh, in, in numbers. And for those of you that weren't aware, um, and I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt for a second. I'm already starting to get a little glitchy here. I've got three people in the house that are on um, Zoom calls too. So I'm gonna turn my video off for a second and but I'll still be here. Um, so the Fish and Wildlife Service, this species, monarch butterfly, one of the most abundant on the, you know, across the country for butterflies, what everybody sees and knows is actually trending uh, really towards extinction if, if something's not done. We, it was, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service has been assessing whether or not uh, to list monarchs and this past December, there was only a few other things going on, so many people might not have noticed, but the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, released its final listing decision uh, this past December. And the, the decision was made that basically it was warranted for listing, but, but there was a preclusion to finding. And what that means is that a warranted but precluded finding means that the species is at a level and needs to be listed and should be listed. However, we have a huge backlog of species. There are species, believe it or not, <laughs> that are even in worse shape than uh, monarch butterflies. Given limited funds, limited staff, uh, limited abilities to get these species listed, which is a, a pretty big process, um, we are not listing the monarch at this time because there are other species that have priority. Uh, we are going to reassess uh, this uh, decision in 2024, and maybe at that time uh, it will be it it will be listed. Um, there are some things we're doing in the meantime that hopefully will. Uh, uh, at least stem the decline and maybe even increase the populations uh, that would help that assessment in 2024. We would love to get to that point and not have to list it. But, um, and one of the things that we're working on right now is really a lot of habitat restoration monarch and specifically milkweed uh, restoration. Uh, that is a host plant for monarchs. They cannot reproduce without milkweed. Uh, they lay their eggs on milkweed, the caterpillars, the the caterpillars feed on the milkweed, and that is uh, that milkweed provides them with basically the toxicity that main that stays with them through their adult lives, and that's why a lot of critters don't eat monarchs. They learn pretty quickly, but they have to have milkweed. They will not reproduce on any other plants. Um, so we're working on habitat restoration and milkweed restoration, and also we've been working with transportation and uh, uh, power electric. Uh, power companies, uh, especially in their right-of-ways, for maintaining those right-of-ways uh, in ways that will benefit monarchs. We're working on the National Monarch Butterfly Candidate Conservation Agreement with assurances for energy and transportation lands. And what that is basically is a big agreement that energy and transportation will agree to maintain right-of-ways in certain ways that benefit monarchs. And when this species, when or if this species is ever listed, uh, it will give them, uh, I guess, the ability, they will not have to go through some of the consultation 
uh, requirements that are that are required for listed species through the Endangered Species Act as long as they are uh, living up to their agreements. So I wanted to go over that for a little bit uh, for monarchs. And if you need a, additional information or, or interested, there's a website at the bottom there. And, and, and like Jane said at the beginning, this, this uh, presentation will be available for you to go back through uh, in a few weeks or so. Um, and you can get that if you don't get it now. So what's causing uh, these big declines in pollinators? Um, you know, we, we really for the last 20 minutes, all you've heard me talk about is, is how they're declining and we're losing and it's sad and all these bad numbers. But so what exactly is causing that? Well, one of the first things or that's or one of the worst things that's causing uh, some declines is uh, pesticide use. Annually, there's about 1 billion pounds of pesticide that is used in the US. Uh, so 1 billion pounds of pesticide each year. Uh, the scientific community is even in agreement that pesticides are central and responsible or a central and responsible factor uh, for observed declines in terrestrial biodiversity. So, and we, recent studies have also shown that pesticides uh, have adverse uh, effects on the reproduction and uh, feeding habits of native bees. Um, unfortunately, uh, even with the use of all these pesticides, it, it's, it's tough because many crops would benefit in quality and quantity with more thorough pollination. Um, but due to the heavy pesticide use, um, that's cut back. So that's something uh, that we are working with farmers on um, we do know that reduced pollination leads to reduced fruit set and seed set and therefore reduced production. So that's one of the one of the things we're using to work with farmers and trying to increase pollinator habitat on farms. Another cause of decline is disease. Uh, several diseases are affecting uh, our native bee populations. Uh, such as Crithidia bombi, Varroa mites is a bad one, Nosoma serenae, um, to name a few, have been spread from commercially raised uh, bees, bumblebees and honeybees. Um, and what happens is uh, commercially produced bumblebees are used in greenhouse pollination, oftentimes growing tomatoes and some things that are grown in greenhouses. And going back to the 60s and 70s, uh, we started bringing in bumblebees to release into these greenhouses to do the pollination of, of these agricultural plants. And so when I first heard about this, I asked myself, I was like, you know, why are we bringing in bees from Europe? Well, what exactly was happening is we were taking our native bees, our common Eastern bumblebee was one of them. And we were shipping those to uh, England because they actually had the, the methods and procedures down on how to uh, have these bees reproduce and able to ship. And what they would do is uh, in England, they would do that and then ship them back to our farms here in the US and we would release them into greenhouses. But just like anything, there's always the opportunity for those uh, bees to escape. Um, and when they do that, those pathogens that they carry, there, there were some diseases in England that the bees in the US were not uh, immune to, just like uh, a lot of other species we hear about. And so those bees brought those uh, diseases back and it has really spread through our native bee populations really uh, quite detrimentally. Um, there's a, a, a lot of species of bees that are found that these diseases affect uh, not only um, their uh, reproductive systems, but also their immune systems. And then you put into uh, put into that that pesticides we've found pesticides also uh, get into the abdominal tract and affect the natural bacteria that occur in the abdominal tract of bees, which there in <laughs> affects the immune system uh, of the bee. And so you put that in line with these diseases, and it's just uh, been it's it, it's been not a good it's not a good thing for bees they're kind of getting hit from all angles there. Another reason, uh, habitat loss. This is probably one of the, 
biggest and, and kind of most in our face uh, reasons for, for pollinator declines across the country. Um, and one of the biggest things is developments not only remove habitat, but they typically replace those habitats with non-native fescue lawns or uh, land, we, you know, we tend to landscape with annual plants, annual, uh, annual flowers or summer blooming flower species. Uh, and another thing that, that happens from these developments, as you can see um, in this picture, uh, it creates hard edges. And what we mean by hard edge is this basically comes from trees straight to grass. There's no step down of habitat. There's no uh, structure in there. There's no diversity. Um, and that is not a good thing. That fragmentation also separates populations of species. So reproduction gets bottlenecked. Um, the fragmentation of habitat, it erodes the genetic variability between uh, species, reduces gene flow and increases inbreeding. So that's a problem too. And, and also another one that's really come up recently is climate change. Um, our climate is changing. It's getting warmer. Uh, we tend to get uh, bigger and more rainstorms. I know the last couple of years here in Nashville even have been some of the wettest on record. It's all, every year either ties or just about beats the, la the previous year uh, for temperature rises. Things are changing. Um, we do know that this is happening and it is having a, a pretty major effect on our insect species. Uh, monarch butterflies uh, for one, uh, we know the, the central population that flies down to Mexico, they require a certain environment down there. And the International Monarch Reserve in Mexico is actually expected to become climatically unsuitable for monarchs by the end of the century, if we continue on the trends that we're on right now. Another climate issue is uh, bumblebees, ten, bumblebees, for one, tend to really like cool weather. Um, and what we've been seeing is, is this movement of bumblebees northward in the US, northward and higher in elevation. Um, and, and this is just so that they can stay with the cooler temperatures. And so these climate issues, uh, the climate is also happening so fast, climate change is happening so fast that it's not giving a uh, species time to make these, these movements to, to really maintain viable populations. Then also, you know, really, unfortunately, we can't just point our finger at one smoking gun. It really is this cumulative toxic soup of all of these. As I mentioned, you get the pesticide use, which reduces the immune uh, systems of, of bees. And then there's all these extra diseases that are out there. It's warming, so the diseases are more prevalent. Um, we're reducing habitat and reducing genetic flow. So that also um, uh, makes species weaker, they can adapt. So it's really this just toxic soup of harmful effects that's, that's affecting our pollinators. And so we, it, it makes it really tough when you're trying to come up with ways to help a species when there are so many things that are cumulatively affecting it. And altogether, these factors are causing a decrease in populations. Study after study, survey after survey seems to conclude that pollinator species and their habitats are being lost at alarming rates. Um, we're facing possible extinction of many pollinator species, including ones that were once deemed very common. Uh, give you an idea of that, more than 17% of our North American butterflies are at risk or being pushed towards extinction. More than 700 of the 4,000 species of bees in North America are inching toward extinction. And at least 25% of North American species of bumblebees are at risk of extinction. Um, it's not a good trend that we're on. And when you think about these, you know, it's enough to make your head spin. Uh, what are we gonna do? Where do we go? It's almost uh, difficult to think that there is a path forward, but I think we can do something. We have things we have things to do that can help pollinators and help them greatly. And what are those things? Where do we start? Well, pollinator conservation. We have to prioritize pollinator and pollinator habitat conservation. 
from planners to developers, residential homeowners to renters, uh, scientists studying effects in pest, of pesticides in the lab to biologists in the field doing surveys, uh, private citizens to public agencies, everyone uh, has, a, has an opportunity to help pollinators in some way. Uh, some efforts are simple and straightforward. Uh, other solutions will require a fundamental shift in our traditional thoughts of vegetative beauty uh, and what we consider to be acceptable landscaping practices. We really need to start considering and planning and creating our surroundings with an idea of functionality that has components of healthy habitat for wildlife and pollinators instead of our traditional landscaping values that include expansive non-native grass lawns and non-native plants that provide poor nutrient food sources and little more than some colorful flowers. Uh, one of the best ways to think of this is you hear about it in the news sometimes of people planting gardens in their front yard and whatever the local ordinance is, uh, you know, it, it states that it has to be maintained grass. Um, that's a really kind of one that really jumps out at me sometimes. And I'll give you another example, which is kind of crazy. I'll touch on these in a little bit, but uh, I, I review and work with solar uh, farm developers, um, solar installations. And we work with them to try to uh, plant pollinator habitat and wildflowers on these sites because they really are basically just these vast lawns that they constantly mow. And some of the ones where we've gotten some of this work done, it's been really surprising at how often we, uh, the developers come back to me and tell me that they're getting complaints from, uh, from citizens of how it looks overgrown, how it looks messy, how it looks, you know, unkept and, and that kind of thing. And so we really are going to have to change our mindset. And non-native grasses, if you really think about it, we have been taught how to maintain these beautiful lawns. So surely there's a way that we can reteach ourselves to maintain these more pollinator and wildlife friendly habitats in our yard. And sometimes it may look a little messy, but there are ways to do them without looking so messy as well. But it's just, it's those types of actions are where we're gonna have to move ourselves towards. So what's pollinator conservation look like? Uh, there's several different things that can be done in that. One is species surveys. Surveys are important. They document their occurrences of species over time. Also show how species and populations are moving uh, and changing from effects of, from external stimuli such as climate change. Uh, many declines in populations have happened so fast though, we're a little behind the eight ball on collecting data. Uh, 25, 20, 25 years ago, uh, nobody had any idea that we were gonna see the type of declines that we're seeing these days. And so, um, nobody was really studying them. Uh, we do have records across the state really over the last hundred years for some species, but they're sporadic and it's not enough that you can, you can really use. Uh, I'll use rusty patch bumblebee as, a, as an example here. We have hundreds of records that really go back to the early 1900s, um, but for the most part, any kind of extensive sur uh, surveys and studies on that species have, has only really happened in the last 25 years. Um, and just, and for that, because of that, you know, like I said earlier, it didn't, we didn't notice, it didn't really start declining until the late nineties. And so nobody really thought any, thought that much about it. And so surveys are important though, for, for, basically keeping an eye on these species, see how they're changing and being able to change our, our conservation efforts accordingly. It's not just specialists or biologists though that do the surveys and, and provide important information. Anyone can. You don't have to be an, an expert and be able to identify every pollinator species. Really, anyone with a camera these days can use any of the citizen science programs available to document species occurrences, feeding activities, to document or provide data for population dynamic assessments. Um, given the, sh the short staffing and budgetary issues that natural resource agencies contend with these days, having additional people and citizens, private citizens out and about and documenting species is more helpful than ever. It's really 
citizen science efforts are really going to be the way that that we are able to move forward and collect data that will be used for future conservation management decisions. Um, and what I have up on the screen there is there are several citizen science programs that you can just join and upload your photos. And there are specialists on there that will identify the species in your photos. Discoverlife.org, Bumblebee Watch, iNaturalist is one. Um, iNaturalist, I, I have that one picture up on the screen there. Uh, the search for the Rusty Patch Bumblebee is a citizen science project that I started with, or that the Fish and Wildlife Service and I started with Wild South, a local um, uh, conservation group, uh, started this on INAT. And we were able to run this for about two years, 2018 and 2019. We ran into some issues in 2019. Um, and the this particular citizen project is currently not active on iNaturalist. But I am hoping in this year to get this back up and running. And so the reason I put this up on the screen is, if nothing else, just so uh, you know, to keep eyes and ears out uh, and for this to, to be activated again. And I would love to have anyone that's out there and available and interested to join and, and help uh, get more observations on there. And if you look at that, even we had five over 500 observations in really what was about a year and a half worth of uh, surveys and that's just because and that's just with 23 people. So the more people you get out there um, on the ground, the better. Another important conservation measure is just large scale plans. Um, the state North Carolina Wildlife Resource Commission, they put together a state wildlife action plan every 10 years. Uh, this is actually a mandate from Congress for the state to be eligible for federal funding under the state wildlife grants program, the, uh, they have to put together a, a comprehensive conservation strategy. Uh, no and North Carolina's last update was in 2015. Uh, so it's, it's fairly recent, it'll be updated another five years. Due to declining pollinator populations though in North Carolina, uh, the plan does include 28 insect species list that are listed in there as species of greatest conservation need. Uh, pollinators in, in that plan include uh, the tawny, tawny crescent, St. Francis satyr, uh, there's the American bumblebee again, Bombus pennsylvanicus, and golden northern bumblebee is another one, Bombus fervidus. But there's actually seven different bumblebees included in this plan. And the plan, uh, the plan is put together and it's available online. And I have some uh, references to that at the end of this presentation that you can, you can find it. The biggest and most important thing I think that I wanna talk about today though is uh, in pollinator conservation is, is habitat creation, restoration, enhancement. And it's probably the most important action uh, we can take. Uh, it's vital if we're going to turn the tide of pollinator declines. And the good thing about pollinator habitat conservation uh, is that it's something we can do now. It's something that we can, we can implement, uh, we can get on the ground, and we can see results instantly. It's one of those things like you build it and they will come. I promise you, if you get pollinator habitat on the ground, you will see an increase of pollinators in your yard. So it is, it is a valuable tool in conservation. Um, for pollinator habitat conservation, I've broke it out into, there's basically three components that really most of us probably learned in basic biology. Those components are food, shelter, and water. Uh, for this presentation in particular though, I wanna take one step further and I break shelter into nesting, sheltering, and overwintering areas. Uh, because the creation and enhancement and preservation of pollinator habitat is the one action that any of us can take and immediately make a difference on the ground, uh, I want to take some time here and go into more detail of what the components of pollinator conservation or pollinator habitat conservation entails. First off is just providing food resources. Um, 
it's not quite so simple as, as going to your nearest box store and grabbing plants. Most of the plants you find there, uh, probably 98%, 99% of the plants you'll find at the big box stores are not native. One of the, one of the most uh, crucial things I, can, I want to uh, emphasize is that you should use native plant species when uh, planting uh, pollinator habitat at your house. Number one, those plants are uh, more adapted to the environment where they're being planted. Most of the native plants require very little maintenance and the food resources that they provide uh, for species are higher in proteins and amino acids, which is very important uh, for many pollinators. A lot of the non-native species, plant species that you find at the store um, typically are very low in those vital nutrients. Uh, another important component is you want consistent blooms throughout the, the uh, growing period. You want blooms to in your garden to start in the spring and you want blooms all the way through the fall before these species uh, go back for their winter um, in their winter pupae forms or uh, whatever. And before they come out in spring, you need food when they're coming out that's going to be readily available. So different species of plants, it's, in, it's, in, it's important to have different species of plants in your garden that will provide those consistent blooms throughout the, throughout the seasons. Another important part to keep in mind is that you need different plant species to, that provide different floral characteristics. Um, as I mentioned earlier, pollinators and plants have evolved for millions of years and they, uh, there are different things that they've evolved together, just like buzz pollination. Some plants also have very deep flowers and there are some bees that are known as long-tongued bees. They have evolved to be able to feed on those deep flowers. So they are attracted to those plants. And so varied floral characteristics is important. Host plants, I mentioned earlier, milkweed for, for monarchs, really important. There are some plants for some species that that is the only plant that they, they can use to reproduce. Uh, regal fritillary that I mentioned earlier, uh, they use violets. So lots of violets on the landscape. They, violet, it, violets are their host plants. And another important part is to include trees and shrubs. You'd be amazed, uh, a lot of the early spring blooms and food sources for, for pollinators come from trees and shrubs. Those are some of the first ones to bloom out in the spring. Uh, and it also provides structure uh, to your habitat uh, there. It, it, it provides shelter and some other things that we'll talk about in a second. I always like to throw this into my presentation. Um, the benefit, another benefit of just using native plants, even outside of um, benefiting pollinators, um, most native plants grow extensive and deep root systems. Um, as you can tell here, this comparison of turf grass roots to native grass roots, uh, these deep, deep root systems increase the soil's capacity to store water. They can significantly reduce water runoff and consequently they decrease erosion and flooding issues. Uh, native plants help reduce air pollution. They sequester carbon better than, than most of our, definitely better than turf grass. Uh, they provide better components of, of food and shelter for wildlife. And the native plants promote biodiversity and stewardship of our, of our natural heritage. They are plants that were on the landscape prior to uh, European colonization when uh, habitats were much, much different and these plants were, were probably much more common on the landscape. Um, so I, I, always, I always find that so interesting though that when you think about the prairies and the deep dark uh, soil that would be found in prairies and this is why these deep rooted native plants So food plots and pollinator food plots, uh, establishing those, it's, it's as tricky as you wanna make it. Uh, there are different ways. There's direct seeding and transplanting as you just saw that tractor rolling around there. Um, that's a um, seed drill on the back of that. It's used for planting large sites. Um, you can also uh, use a hand spreader like in the other picture there, but 
Uh, also, transplanting uh, potted plants is one of the easiest ways, especially if you're creating a smaller uh, pollinator garden. And for and since I mentioned that size is really not the biggest importance, uh, you know, we we typically recommend that you try to make it at least a 10 by 10 bed, but there is really nothing that says even small, you know, uh, smaller than that provides benefits because I have small sections around and I see butterflies and, and bees on some of the smaller planted sections as well, just as well as the bigger ones. Um, but one of the most important things that you're going to do in establishing pollinator food plots is, is your location and your site prep. Site prep being probably the biggest of all. Um, there's different ways you can go about that. Uh, you can, if you have turf, you can use a sod cutter to cut it up. Uh, you can also uh, um, solarize, uh, use plastic over it, uh, put plastic over the ground. It needs to be left on for at least one growing season to be uh, successful. Uh, those, are, those are really probably some of the best ways for smaller areas if you're going to be doing those. Uh, Seeding often, if you're going to be, once you get your site prepped, if you're going to be seeding, uh, you want to put those seeds out in the winter. Most of those need to be uh, cool, cold stratified. They require cold, wet, a certain amount of cold temperature before they'll germinate. Um, but if you're transplanting or just planting potted plants, that can be done really about any time up through the summer. Um, I've, there are some species, even like some of the native grasses you can put out in the fall. Uh, but for the most part, Spring and summer is, are great times to plant uh, transplants. You just want to make sure that if you are using transplants, that they're not, they haven't been treated with uh, insecticides or, or neonicotinoids. Um, going back to that native plant thing again, there's no need to fertilize those. You want, they, once you get them established, they require very little maintenance. There's no mowing involved, there's no cleaning, except for one, about once a year, you want to clean the site. And just a shameless plug here, real quick. Uh, I will be giving a presentation uh, in May for the Master Gardeners here at the Buncombe County Cooperative Extension. And at that presentation will be just about solely done or solely presented on uh, establishing pollinator food plots. So it'll be going into much more detail, going into these uh, elements here and really providing a lot more specifics on, on how to do that. So if you are interested in those details, please uh, tune in and I'm not sure, uh, I'm maybe speaking out, but hopefully uh, uh, Ollie can put this in the newsletter um, about something like that, or at least uh, over some emails, maybe we can get the word out to people for that presentation. So the next part in pollinator uh, habitat conservation is shelter. And as I mentioned, I've broken that out to nesting and sheltering, sheltering habitat being one uh, about 70% of America, North America's native uh, bees are ground nesters. About 30% of those native bees nest in wood tunnels. So it's very important to leave dead decaying wood or, or uh, open uh, bare spots of dirt around. Native bunch grasses, uh, little blue stem, big blue stem, uh, Indian grass, a lot of those native grasses are great, provide great shelter and nesting habitat. Also providing, to provide uh, shelter, uh, leave uh, piles of debris in your yard. I know that's one, not everybody can do that due to some of those ordinances that we spoke about earlier, but if you are in an area where you can leave debris, many different pollinator species use that for structure and, uh, for, and for, sh for sheltering and for nesting. And the reason I break those out, it kind of seems like nesting and sheltering are the same, but Nesting, I'm using that as where they might nest and sheltering is, is areas that they can use for safety uh, to avoid predators as they move between food sources. So that's a, kind of the difference that I broke those into there. Um, large boulders, piles of rocks, uh, piles of dirt um, also uh, are great ways to provide shelter and nesting sites uh, on a, on a, in an area. And then lastly, I want to bring up hedgerows. And this has been a fairly recent thing for, for, for me in the past few years. But hedgerows are great features to meet habitat requirements. They've been found to host some of the highest diversity in communities 
of uh, beneficial insects than any other landscape feature. Uh, studies show that hedgerows tend to export pollinators instead of concentrate them, which is a concern with farmers. And so this is a, one of the practices that we're working with farmers to implement to try to provide more pollinator habitat in between fields. And hedgerows are so important that I do want to take a second and just speak to them a little bit more. Uh, what makes them so important is just the diversity and structure of them. Uh, from an environmental perspective, adding or preserving hedgerows is one of the most beneficial actions you can take. Um, they're the ultimate multitaskers of the landscape, of the landscape features. They provide numerous benefits, including preventing erosion, uh, stabilizing soil, uh, they act as effective wind breaks, uh, reduce evaporative water loss in nearby garden spaces, and probably most importantly, uh, hedgerows function as essential wildlife habitats for really everything, native mammals, reptiles, birds, insects. And because pollinators have predators too, uh, hedgerows offer a vital shelter and, and much needed uh, movement corridors to travel between feeding areas. Um, these long strips of uninterrupted hedgerows in farm habitats uh, are essential really to, en to enhance native pollinator abundance and to increase production on farms. And like I said, again, uh, we are working with farmers and when these, when these particular uh, features are implemented on the landscape, uh, they provide food sources for pollinators when crops aren't flowering. And then they also provide cover uh, between fields. Some pollinators will not move across vast expanses of, of open areas like you see on some of these industrial farms. And so breaking that down and giving movement uh, and to give them cover so that they can move without fear of predation is important. Um, studies have shown that when hedgerows have been implemented on farms, they've seen 10 to 20% uh, to increase uh, in adequate pollinator diversity and abundance, and which has also resulted in increased production on some of the farms where this has been studied. So the other, other part of our, of our shelter uh, component is overwintering habitat. Um, Many of you have heard, but it, it's really important and really hard <laughs> actually one to do. Um, I'm constantly uh, kind of chasing my wife around who loves to rake leaves in the fall, uh, trying to get the rake out of our hands because we need to leave those leaves in place. Uh, there are many species uh, of moths and butterflies that uh, pupate over the winter in leaf litter. Uh, Luna moths being one, of those species and this is actually a cocoon of a luna moth and you can tell there's a reason that it looks like a leaf. <laughs> they, they need that leaf litter for cover, for protection, and also just to, for protection from the elements. Um, Io moths are another uh, species that uses leaf litter uh, for overwintering. Another one is uh, forced keeping forest story open. Um, and contrary to some uh, professional, uh, <laughs> uh, with quote quotation marks professionals out there, I'm not saying go rake all the forests. But um, what I am saying is if there are stands of forests that are just completely eat up or are or, or covered up in invasive species, it is a good idea to get in and remove those invasive species and open up the forest floor a little bit. Um, many species of bees, uh, actually, especially bumblebees, will use these open forests and need open forests to get in and, and overwinter. Brush piles, again, are always an important and easy feature to do if you can do that. And then also planting hollow stemmed plants in your yard during the summer. Uh, there are many solitary species of bees or solitary bee species that use these plants, they lay their eggs in the hollow stems and those eggs will, will hatch and the larvae will, will remain in those hollow stems throughout the winter um, and, and come out in the spring. Uh, and so if you do plant those hollow stemmed plants, um, you know, just remember, don't, uh, in your winter cleanup, don't 
cut them all down and throw them away because you could be throwing away a bunch of baby bees in there. So um, some of the hollow stem plants that I've got here, goldenrod, um, Joe pie weed, any of the silphiums, things like that too. The last component we mentioned, water. Um, and I'm not saying everybody has to have a perfectly flowing stream to be able to provide uh, some clean water resources for pollinators. Really, there are lots of DIY, DIY ways to do it. Um, you can purchase bird baths, purchase pots, uh, any kind of uh, indention that can hold, hold water is valuable and useful to provide water, much needed water resources for species. The most important thing if you do use a pot or a bird bath is to just provide some measure that uh, allows the bees to get in on a shallow entry and exit. You don't want uh, uh, pollinators, butterflies or bees falling in and drowning. Um, so whether it's rocks or marbles or whatever that is, just to create a shallow uh, spot and shallow access to water is, is really important. And so now that we've discussed the fundamentals of habitat conservation. Um, I'd really like to show, take a few minutes here and show you some ongoing projects where these principles are being implemented, um, some big and some large uh, that I've, I've been working on over the past few years. Hopefully some of these projects will provide some insight into the opportunities uh, and demonstrate ways that you can direct your individual actions or projects to protect pollinators. One of the biggest things that we've been working on is public and private lands management um, and how, how areas are maintained. One of the most in, important tools that we have with this is using fire on the landscape. Um, fire does, like I said earlier, it, it's a good tool for, for clearing out that understory in the forest. Um, it's a naturally occurring. Fire used to be much more predominant on the landscape uh, before European colonization. Not only naturally set fires, Native Americans also used fires to create large open areas, but fires are, uh, are an important aspect to, to, to creating good pollinator habitat, whether it's in open fields or in forests or on the high elevation bulbs. And so we work with uh, agencies like the Forest Service and um, the State Forest Service in implementing uh, healthy fires on the landscape. Another one, it's not just fires uh, that's used to, to control and to manage these open sites for pollinators. We work with the Forest Service to maintain and the Park Service in maintaining open bulbs. Um, this is just a good example of, that I like to show uh, of beauty spot bald in the Cherokee National Forest. This is, I was out doing surveys one day and this is what it looked like I heard a rumbling coming up the road and within, an, within a few hours, this is what that site looked like. And this was in August, a prime feeding and reproductive uh, period for, for many pollinators. Um, and so they came in and mowed it. Uh, not to fault anybody, sometimes in agencies you have people that have done things for 30 years or 40 years the same way. Um, and so sometimes it takes a little time to get things turned around. But we have been able and have been working with the Forest Service to change up their management strategies on some of these open bulbs to decrease the effects and, and, and make them even more healthy for pollinators. Um, and here I'd also like to throw out some thanks to the Appalachian Trail Conservancy um, for working with us in the Forest Service and, and really being a primary driver in maintaining some of these open habitats and maintaining them in a way that uh, provides for, for healthy uh, pollinator uh, diversity and populations. North Carolina Wildlife Resource Commission, um, Sandy Mush Gamelands here in town. We've been working with them for a few years to conduct burns um, and work and kind of we've been also working with them to do some surveys and studies out there to see how pollinators react uh, uh, to these burns, uh, what species are predominant afterburns or how many years after. Uh, that's, we actually have one study that's still ongoing that we're working with the commission on out there. But you can see one of the most important things, and I've 
I mentioned it earlier, when you're creating and trying to get these native plants to grow, you really have to get back to bare dirt. It's back to that whole site prep idea. Um, and the site prep really has to alleviate all non-native species uh, in order to, to really increase your success, uh, the opportunity for success for creating pollinator food plots and native species. But this is what some of them look like afterward. Here's narrow leaf mountain mint growing all up a hillside. Um, you know, goldenrods, uh, native grasses. And, you know, if you look off in the distance here, here's purple top tridents and really nice stand there. Um, just a nice diversity on some of these areas that are now being maintained uh, with more of a mindset of wildlife and pollinators in mind. Um, and so these areas are on different burn cycles. They'll come back in. And uh, the one on the right there actually, probably, it's a good chance it will be burned this year, hopefully. It's, it's really kind of getting to the point where it needs it. But uh, Wildlife Resources Commission is doing a lot of work out there. If you're interested in seeing some nice pollinator habitat, Sandy Mush Gamelands is a good spot for it. One of the biggest things I've been working on in recent years is solar uh, installations. I mentioned earlier, North Carolina is the second largest solar producer in the country. So really we're producing these and putting these massive solar installations on the ground that just turn into huge lawns for the most part. So what we're doing is working with those uh, developers to implement pollinator habitat on these sites. Um, there's a lot of valuable, uh, a lot of benefits to that not only is pollinator habitat and, and food and, and shelter being provided, but it also lessens their maintenance. Uh, the, the solar installation on the right, right here, um, there's one about this size that I was working on and the company was spending over $4,000 a month in mowing costs for that installation. And so we've been working with them to plant the whole site out with pollinator species it's been pretty successful so far. Um, they've already been able, just in the last few years, uh, to cut their maintenance down in half. And so uh, we're working on planting out the rest of the site as well. Um, but that's just the kind of benefits that can be found. Uh, I'd like to throw out as thanks where it's, wherever I can, the North Carolina Pioneer Conservation Alliance. Um, I'm a founding member of that and st still active. Uh, they produce guidance for pollinator habitat uh, preservation and education. Um, and one of the best tools out there has been prepared by the North Carolina Botanical Garden, who is a member. Um, it's a pollinator toolkit. But also a colleague and I put together this technical guidance for native plantings on solar sites in 2018. And this is something that we've been using as a tool when working with uh, solar developers to get their sites uh, pollinator friendly. And here's just some photos of some of the sites that we've got. I'm not gonna pretend today that this, that this has been hugely successful. I mean, there, there is nowhere near the amount of, of facilities implementing this strategy that I, would, that I would like to see, but we are making headway. The pandemic has put a little stall on a lot of things, uh, this being one, but we do have a handful of a half dozen or so uh, installations around the state that, or around our work area, there's probably more across the state um, that have implemented pollinator habitat on their sites. We're also working with transportation and energy right of ways, not only on the Monarch Butterfly uh, CC, uh, CCAA, but also just in overall management. Um, I had a phone call with Duke Energy yesterday, actually, where we were discussing a, a implementing maintenance and management plan on a site for uh, native plant species, including a plant species that's endangered. So uh, we are working with these guys. There are some areas where uh, we've had some success and seen some nice production. Um, and uh, so hopefully this is gonna be something that grows in the future. If I remember right, I can't remember how many million uh, miles of, of transportation or of uh, transmission and distribution power lines there are. Uh, I think it's, it's something like five 
five million miles of distribution lines and about 200,000 miles of major transmission lines. So we have a lot of area uh, to work with in trying to get them to manage these sites uh, properly. And then one of the biggest things, and I like to throw this in, this is really one of my last few slides. Uh, and this is again, kind of like putting pollinator uh, plots in your yard. Really some of the biggest things we can do for, concert, for pollinator conservation is increasing our community gardens and our outreach and education uh, for others, opportunities for others. Uh, these can be, you know, these pollinator plots can be established at schools, at residential developments, churches, places of business, parks, wherever there's open space, really. Uh, and, you know, remember a pollinator garden is, if it's a prepped and established properly, maintenance issues such as watering and weeding and mowing is, is really uh, uh, not necessary. Uh, there's some, some cleanup in the winter, but for the most part, once you get these plots established, uh, there's very little work that needs to be done. Um, just to throw out a few examples, these are a few community gardens that we've worked on. In 2019, I had about 15 acres altogether of planted habitat in Western North Carolina. Uh, 2020 has really put, a, a, put the kibosh on that. Um, I've had a few small projects, uh, but, but nothing like we were gearing up for a while there. Uh, but just recently, um, I did submit a uh, an establishment and maintenance plan to the city along with Asheville Greenworks uh, to plant out a section of the Greenway down on the French Broad in the River Arts District. Um, this priority to South Meadow is about a third of an acre of pollinator meadow habitat that we'll be creating there <clears throat> as soon as the city gives us uh, the go ahead. I do wanna point to this priority one North Meadow area. That's another pollinator uh, plot that has already been planted out and again throwing out some thanks to Betsy Savely and Carolina Native Nursery for getting that finished out. It really looks nice if you're down there in the spring check that out. That was all planted with uh, potted plants. Um, it's a and then the one priority two that we'll be planting hopefully in the next year or so will be done by uh, seeding. So it will be a little more uh, thick and, and overgrown looking kind of like the picture you see there. But uh, that's kind of the, the point of that one. Uh, and so the biggest thing, though, is just creating these opportunities for our youngsters and for other people to be able to see and, and, and work and, and understand what it, what, what it takes to create uh, pollinator habitat and the importance of doing that. Additional actions, um, you know, there are many things, not only just helping with, uh, with things throughout your community, getting those ordinances changes, you know, and I'm not saying every house has to look like the one right here with, with it being really overgrown, but, but that is a more healthy um, landscape from a wildlife and pollinator uh, perspective than, um, than for it to be just mowed every few days or week. Um, you know, it's important to get rid of non-native species, uh, and without going through the list here, one of the biggest things I want to point out that, that's a new recent uh, recommendation that there's more and more science starting to come in on this, and that's the lighting. Your, your outdoor lighting at night uh, really need to reduce that as much as possible. There has been more and more findings that that light pollution is affecting uh, insect populations and especially your nocturnal pollinators, moths. And so uh, one of the biggest things is to make, if you are gonna have outdoor lighting, make sure it's shielded downward. And um, there's a, a lot of the new LED lights have a color spectrum on them. Just make sure that it's at least below the 3000 Kelvin. Um, so those really white lights that you see, those are really horrible. And they're actually, it's starting to show more that they're really unhealthy for plants that live around them as well. So, uh, but just get the, the more yellow orange um, lighting for outdoor and just reduce it as much as possible. And then one of the biggest things you can do for just some outreach is to certify your pollinator garden. And I like to throw this up there. Just there's a Xerxes has a national pollinator habitat certification program, but here locally Greenworks uh, and Asheville B City is, is working together to uh, 
and has created a, a certification program. Um, I think we're it's up to 58 gardens have been certified and it just went into, uh, it just started this past year. There's an online application, it's a tiered structure. You can go to the website there and check it out. Uh, and you can, uh, if depending on what uh, tier you qualify for, there's a sign that you can purchase and put in your yard as well, just to show off your, uh, your accomplishments. Additional tools and resources there. Um, again, this presentation will be available for you to go through. And um, so those will be there. And, there. and if there's ever any questions or anything that I can give or anything pops up, my contact information is there. Feel free to call or email. Email is probably best these days. Um, I am more than happy to work with folks, even to come to sites and, and check out and maybe give you some assessments or some ideas on what to do. Um, I can't promise that I can do every site that pops up, um, but, uh, you know, especially these days. But uh, I try to get out and we can do as much as we can. If nothing else, I can off, often work from pictures and discussions on the phone. So don't hesitate to reach out to me and ask any questions. And with that, I just wanna thank everybody again for hanging in there with me, uh, going through this presentation. Hopefully there's some, some information that, uh, that, you know, that was new for you. And if nothing else too, maybe there's something in there that uh, spurred some interest and, and I hope to see you uh, out in the field and maybe even at, don't forget that presentation in May if you are interested in creating uh, pollinator plots. And so thanks everybody. Uh, Brian, there are 14 questions in the uh, q and I don't know if you want me to summarize some of them or if you feel like you have time to go through all of them or not, which what oh, would you prefer? I'm having trouble pulling those up. Um, is well, then there... I'll read them off to you. Yeah, okay, that would be good. Okay, I'll start at the beginning. Uh, there was one question when you were first talking about monarchs and how there's been a loss of habitat in Mexico. So what, what would you attribute to why there was such a decrease in uh, And that is solely attributed to climate change. Um, the tree species that are down there uh, uh -huh. require their elevational dependence. So they need cooler nights and, and, and the warming temperatures down there and the warming temperatures that we are, have seen and are trending uh, are decreasing the available habitat. Uh, the tree species that they live in or that they winter over winter in. Okay, and the next one was uh, from Linda. She's raised monarchs before and she hasn't seen many here. What else can she do besides growing uh, milkweed in her yard to help with the monarchs? Yeah, and thanks for growing out uh, monarchs. Um, that's something I've kind of gotten involved in the last few years and my kids really love doing that. Um, you know, growing them out and, and, and even tagging them and trying to keep up and uh, allow them for the opportunity at least for some of those tagged butterflies to maybe be found as, an, uh, as another important step that could be taken just to add to that. Um, as really, you know, it, it changes from year to year. This past year was kind of a mediocre year for what we see through here. Um, the, the population counts in Mexico for 2019 were actually a little better than they've been in years. And current and 2020's numbers are not out yet. There is some optimism uh, out there for, for, for how big it, the, the number of butterflies and the area that they're uh, overwintering in this year. Uh, there's some optimist, optimistic uh, thoughts coming out. And, but until we see those final numbers, we won't know for sure. But I agree with you that um, this past year especially was really poor pollinator year all the way around. I got calls from really all over the country uh, just through some networks. And a lot of people were seeing really decreased numbers um, compared to even just recent years. And it was a little alarming. I'm not quite sure there can be, uh, you know, cycles. Um, it would really be weird for, you know, whole Eastern half of the country to be in some kind of cycle together, but I've got my fingers crossed that this coming year will look uh, more positive. But uh, as far as that goes, just keep planting those plants, you know, increase your pollinator, uh, your food resources there. 
um, you know, put it as much as you can, but also those milkweed species. And, and then I'll always say, you know, you can only do so much at your site, but you have friends and relatives and maybe know some other places and just working with, with uh, other entities to get more food and more host plants on the ground. I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer. <laughs> I wish I did. Uh, the next question is, are there any organizations that give out free milkweed seed? There are. Um, Asheville Bee City and Greenworks, uh, if you're not tied into those organizations, um, might be good to get on some of their websites. Uh, I do know there are some uh, plants distributors locally who are growing extra milkweed plants each year and either donating them or selling them at reduced costs. costs. Um, uh, North Carolina a Native Plant Nursery, uh, just on a meeting with them the other day, uh, apparently they are taking this coming year and planting a bunch of milkweed, extra milkweed plants as well, and we'll have those for, for projects or, or whatever. So there are, there, there are a good bit available, and um, I'm trying to think of maybe the best way. The, probably the best way is just getting tied in with Greenworks and, and kind of keeping up with, with what's going on. Um, and at any time, too, when it gets up closer to spring, feel free to shoot me an email with that very question. Just say, hey, have you heard of any, anybody out there with plants? Um, and I'll definitely, I'll definitely hunt them down for you. Great. Uh, there are a few questions about what are the top plants you would recommend to help pollinators, including some that you would grow um, in hedges. So that covers about three questions there. Oh, okay. Um, you know, uh, there's so many plants and one of the, I'll also point to actual Greenworks again. They, we've all worked together and we've created, they've created a, a nice native plant list that's on their certification program. Um, you can go on there and find out. Uh, some of the, uh, we, in a meeting this past week, a term came up of workhorse uh, uh, pollinator plants and thought that was kind of interesting and, and an interesting thought if nothing else. And, and there are some that just, uh, you know, tons of species just really love. I, one that I love, especially for bees is partridge pea. Um, that's a good one. Um, cone flowers are good. They're easy to grow. Uh, your bee bombs, your mints, uh, your native mints, native spotted bee balm. Uh, those are really good um, pollinators. It, and, and again, it's really going to depend. There's some in the spring, there's good ones in the summer, and there's good, good ones in the fall. In the fall, it's going to be your golden rods. Um, so the, the thing to keep in mind is that in each of those seasons, you want to have at least three uh, species, different, different plant species that are blooming during each period, two to three. Mm -hmm. um, so I could probably sit here and name out, I don't know, I could probably go through all day and just keep naming out ones that are, that are good. Um, and it really just depends on, are you looking at something that's really easy to grow? Black Eyed Susans are good. Pollinators don't, you know, they like them. I'm not, I don't ever see them really covered up, but black eyed Susans are uh, uh, pollinator plants and grow really easy. Uh, blue mist flower is another one that butterflies seem, seem to like. Um, Blazing star is one that I see a lot of butterflies on. Um, so yeah, it really just depends. Uh, but I do, I think probably the best way would be, you know, if you're thinking of putting in a plot, um, don't hesitate. Like I said, shoot me an email. Lay, tell me what size you're looking at. And if nothing else, I'll, and maybe what you're thinking about. And I can put together a couple of species and email them back to you for you to keep your eye out or go purchase um, uh, from a distributor or whatever and get in your garden. I have no problem doing that. Great. Uh, there's a question here. Do you know why DOT insists on using non-natives to plant out on the roadsides and who's responsible for those non-native daylilies around town? That's a great question. And, and yes, I don't, I don't have an answer as to why they continue to use them because uh, native plants would be uh, just as easy to plant. And, and 
just as pretty, if not more beautiful. Yeah. Um, I think it's it's back to that whole mindset of what people are used to and what uh, we traditionally think of as beautiful plants. Um, it, it, a lot of people that haven't that aren't really familiar with native plants will will typically immediately jump to cosmos or uh, you know uh, or lily some of those some of the lilies or some you know things like that 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 get planted out and it, it's just because that's what people know um, dot they I will say this in recent years you're not going to see a big ship turn fast but the Fish and Wildlife Service, the North Carolina Pollinator Conservation Alliance. Um, a lot of us are working with DOT to change up uh, their their planting rec uh, their planting lists and and what they're doing in some of the roadsides. And it and it is slowly turning. Um, one of the other things that's going to make that slow is they have this huge warehouse. You know, they have huge stockpiles of certain seeds and certain plants from where they purchased the non-native stuff. And so we're, you know, it, it's getting through all of that. Um, but one of the biggest things is just getting the mindset changed and then also making the availability of native plants uh, more uh, readily accessible and, uh, and, and so that they, you know, and really able to provide on large scale purchases of what like DOT would be making. So um, there is a lot of work being done on that. If nothing else, maybe a little optimism I'll throw your way but on that question. But, um, you know, we have a ways to go and DOT is aware, uh, if nothing else. And, and it, there are some sites that have been replanted with, with uh, native species actually in the past few years. Great. Uh, here's a specific question about insect houses. Insect houses have been used, but birds also are eating from them. So do you have any comments about that? Um, you know, years ago, I, I, was, I was a big promoter of, of the, the uh, bee hotels or the insect houses. Um, I still will, I, I don't promote them as much anymore. I, if someone wants to use one, I definitely would, will not, um, you know, try to sway them differently in a different direction. I usually do mention, though, that you can provide those same uh, habitat qualities uh, in, your, in your plant selection and in your uh, um, site development. You know, you, using things like we mentioned, uh, those those piles of debris or, or large stones or piles of rocks. I mean, there's lots of things that can be incorporated and it doesn't have to be, you know, like a car sized pile of rock. Um, but so, you know, it doesn't have to be this unsightly uh, thing in your yard, but there are ways to meet those same qualities that those, those bee hotels provide in a more natural type setting. The, those bee hotels and stuff are, are, are good and they work they are kind of like a smorgasbord for certain critters that figure them out, uh, like birds and spiders. Um, and for that reason, uh, there's also disease uh, is bad in those. And so they require uh, kind of annual maintenance and cleaning. Um, to, you really have to keep up with those things if you're gonna, if you're gonna have them. But they do, they do work uh, for what they're supposed to do. Um, again, I just go back to, there's, there's better ways to do it than, than the bee hotels. Okay. Now the question asks about what's the difference between uh, bees and wasps? Okay. Uh, well, uh, they're, they're different species. Um, the, the way to tell them a lot of time, tell the difference a lot of times is that the segmented bodies, you know, those, the wasps will often, ha often have those really um, long, what's uh, uh, the word I'm looking for? Uh, breaks in their in their segments, um, and they're usually a lot more thin and narrow and pointy. Uh, there are some native bees that could, could kind of look like that, but for the most part, um, wasps they're just, they're they're a different species. I don't really quite I don't really quite know how to answer um, that question in a much better way than that. I'm sorry. 
That's okay. Um, another one about crabgrass. Do you need to clear it out because it's hard to, difficult to remediate, but do you need to clear it out before you can get the habitat ready for pollinators? Yes. Grasses, any of those non-native grasses, fescue, crabgrass, Bermuda grass, all those things are horrible in what they do. Many of the native plant species, the native pollinator plants that we think about are actually kind of open prairie and savanna plants. The reason that they occur here is uh, that a lot of, there used to be those types of habitats on the landscape. Um, if you look at some of the early uh, maps that Spanish explorers drew and sent back when they were, when they were in the areas now in North Carolina, the whole central part of what is now North Carolina, they called the Grand Savannah. It was just basically large, ex, uh, humongous expanse. So basically the middle third of the state was nothing but these large expanses of open grasslands dotted with islands of trees um, and kind of these hummocky areas. And they were blown away actually by the, by the expanse of open areas uh, like that. And the reason I point that out is because um, that's where those native plants grew. They grew in those types of habitats. And one of the, the primary ways that those habitats were maintained was fire. Um, prairie remnant plants that occur, uh, or prairie plants and prairie remnant plants that occur now, most of them are really uh, in low numbers on the landscape because we have decreased uh, fire on the landscape. Uh, a lot of these plants need just like I showed you on one of those slides where uh, when you're prepping a site, you've really got to get to bare dirt for a lot of these prairie plants to grow um, in these native plant pollinator plants. And so uh, as far as removing the grass, you, the, the one thing I throw out to people that are doing, especially on larger sites, but even smaller ones, you have to mimic what fire would do to a site. Fire would run through and it's going to burn all of the dead stuff. It's going to open up space. It's going to expose some dirt. And that's how those plants are able to reproduce and, and uh, have the vitality that they need to continue. Um, so yes, when you're any of the any of the non-native turf grasses that are any plant, any of the non-native plants that are creating just carpets, um, none of the native plants can compete with that. They won't germinate through those, through those carpets. So for site prep, uh, you really have to get, that, get those cut up and get it down to bare dirt. Okay, um, I know we're running short of time. Somebody asked if you could put your last slide up with all those resources and maybe we can answer some questions. Yeah, and then, cause those are great resources there. So then I'll try to run through these other ones quickly. Um, Something about, uh, do you know if Lowe's and Home Depot use a lot of chemicals on some of their plants? And oh, yeah. Go, go ahead. That's- Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, um, that's one. They, they are more likely to have plants that have been pre-treated. Um, I can't speak recently. I know up to a couple of years ago, one of the last reports I saw is that um, many of the plants that they get in have been pre-treated or and so uh, the other thing to think about, most of the plants that you find at Lowe's or Home Depot are not going to be native um, species. Um, I, I threw the number out of 99% probably, and that's a guesstimate, but I feel pretty safe in that guesstimate that 99% of the plants you buy at Lowe's or Home Depot are not going to be native or local ecotype plants. Um, so whether they're treated or not, <clears throat> I recommend uh, using some of your uh, local distributors or native plant uh, distributors for uh, planting out in your yard. Okay, great. And then there are a couple of questions about um, the use of water. Is there some way to have water available without attracting uh, mosquitoes? Uh, <clears throat> um, you know, one of the things you can do, mosquitoes don't like moving water. And so, uh, you know, you can, you can purchase any number of uh, pumps or solar, little solar fountains or things like that that you can put in that can reduce uh, and will reduce uh, usage by mosquitoes. Um, other than that, you know, uh, water is, is going to attract them. 
Um, I would also, you know, venture to say that between the, the, the grasses and a lot of the, especially the non-native vegetation, which tends to grow so thick um, and over everything. I know I live next to the, to the parkway over here and there's parkway land that's just eat up with wisteria and kudzu. Um, and we have terrible mosquito problems and I, I attribute a lot of it to that thickness because it just holds the moisture in. So um, to answer your question, I would probably use something like those little solar fountains or something. That's about your best bet. Okay. Uh, someone said, thank you for all the beautiful sunflowers along 26. They weren't sure about that. And a lot of these are about non-native species, specifically spe um, plants to plant on steep areas and so forth. But I think the tools and resources list should cover a lot of that. Is that right? Um, it will. And and um, not to really advertise for them, but it's just a it's just a nice. They haven't broken out really nicely. If you go to the uh, as the slide is that's up right now, Ernst Seed, um, they have seed mixes that are already put together. Mm -hmm. that and they have them broken out into different areas for uh, riparian areas, um, upland meadows. Um, there's there they have a, a North Carolina mountain steep slope mix on there. Um, they have a lot of different uh, mixes as do a lot of the other seed producers. Now that that's seeds. Um, so if you're looking at planting potted plants, one way you can do it is go on and see what species they have in those mixes and then look for the plants around and most of the time you can find the plants uh depends on how big of an area um because it can get costly buying plants for a, for a larger area but um you know and again i don't i don't mind you you know shoot me an email with the size of the slope where it's at what you know aspect and we can talk about some things and we can put you to get put together a little list for you um for those kind of more specific uh, sites that you may run into on your property, even shady areas, you know, there's pollinator plants for shady areas as well. Um, again, you know, don't hesitate to use me as a resource. Um, and some of this will also be in that presentation again at the Master Gardeners in May. You are so generous with your time and it looks like we're running, we're, we're already after one o'clock. Um, for those of you who don't get the Fab Friday uh, newsletter, I think the best thing to do is just Google Ollie Asheville and see a contact number and someone will put you on, on the newsletter list. Um, I learned a lot. I have a certified pollinator garden. It mm -hmm. is well worth it. You don't have to have every single plant in there as a native plant. And I agree with Brian. The thing I learned from that is you should have plants for every season of the year. And that really helped me know what else to put in there. So that's my concerns about that. We took out our lawn. We're putting in clover if you like. I don't know if that's a good idea, but clover at least has some flowers that bees will use. But um, not yeah, it's not native, but you know, if you have somewhere where um, you you don't want taller plants growing um, and you would like to get rid of some grass, uh, I would rather see clover there than fescue. Right. Uh, because like you said, it does provide a food resource. And, and thanks for pointing out the, the ease of that certification program. It is an incredible education tool. Um, and yeah, the, the different tiers, I kind of went through that quickly because I was running out of time, but the different tiers in that um, allows for different plantings. And, and it's a great way to, to see, it's, it's nowhere near as difficult as you may think it is to have species of plants that bloom throughout the seasons. Um, a lot of the plants that you can pick will bloom throughout two seasons. So, you know, it might bloom in late spring and go through summer. And so it, it's nowhere near as difficult as it may sound. Right. No, it, it was great. So what I want to do is before it, I mean, we're past the time, but I really would love to, well, I do thank you, Brian. We've learned so much from this. Thank and again, you. this presentation is recorded and will be available at it different date. I also want to remind people that we do not have a Fab Friday next week, but we will have one on February 12th, which is Eric Bedler, who will speak on early electricity in Asheville. 
And also you can check the OLLI newsletter or Google OLLI Observer to find out more information. And uh, if you are interested in any particular topic for Fab Friday or you would like to be a presenter, please let one of the committee members know. That's me, Jane Yokoyama, Barbara Griswold, Martha Marshall, Bruce Jones, or Sue Kibler. I also want to thank Jacqueline, Jacqueline for her technical support and always her patience. And if you have a health-related topic, the person to contact is Jenny Felice. So thank you everyone who's here. I know a lot of you had to leave earlier and thank you again, Brian. It's been a pleasure and we look forward to seeing you more, hopefully for another presentation and for our participants, hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Have a great thank weekend. You.